Coming up on Market to Market. Midwest links to China help tie the knot for the next ambassador. Spirits soar like a hawk for those camped out near the last mile of a controversial pipeline. And the Secretary of Agriculture runs the Bell Lab as his eight years of service come to an end. Those stories and market analysis with Tom Fitzenmeyer next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, December 9 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. There was plenty of conspicuous consumption going on in the lead up to the holiday season. Consumers purchased their fair share of clothing, cell phones, and a host of other goods. The sales pushed the trade deficit to a three-year record as the gap widened by double digits when imports increased by 17 percent between September and October. The demand had U.S. manufacturers replenishing supplies last month as orders for factory goods moved 2.7 percent higher, the best showing in 16 months. Amid fears of a post-election market crash have yet to materialize as the Dow Jones Industrial Average hit a record high on Friday, capping a more than 1,400-point run since November 8th. The stepped-up investment is being fueled in part by potential increases in trade. Canada continues to hold the top spot as a U.S. trading partner, but China runs a close second. This week, the president-elect continued to handpick his administration. In a strange twist of fate, the decision on who should handle diplomatic relations with the country of 1.3 billion people has its roots in the Midwest. Josh Bittner explains. Thanks to our great new president, who's going to make America great again. I am very proud to serve America in this very important role. Thank you very much. This week, Iowa Governor Terry Branstad accepted President-elect Donald Trump's offer to become U.S. Ambassador to China. The governor gave unwavering support for Trump during the run-up to the presidential election. I just want to tell you officially, the man I have chosen as our ambassador to China is the man who knows China and likes China. Better to like China if you're going to be over there. Do we agree? And knows how to deliver results. And he will deliver results, just like he's been delivering results for 23 years for the great farmers and for the people of Iowa. Officials in Beijing welcomed the appointment of America's longest-serving governor to a post which they say bridges the governments of both countries, calling Branstad an old friend of the Chinese people. While China is America's largest economic rival, the two nations also are significant trading partners. In 2015, the U.S. imported over $480 billion in goods and services, while sending $116 billion in exports to the Middle Kingdom. And according to the U.S.-China Business Council, a nonprofit Washington, D.C.-based collection of more than 200 American companies doing business with China, $15 billion in U.S. agricultural products were sold to China last year. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, a former governor of Iowa himself, praised Branstad's appointment as beneficial to U.S. farmers. Uh, I think Governor Branstad uh, uh, deserves that opportunity for several reasons. One, he has been a tireless advocate for trade. Uh, we all know that. Uh, he has certainly been a proud advocate for, Amer for Iowa agriculture and American agriculture. He obviously has relations with uh, Chinese officials, which are important. And he's tenacious. And trust me, with the Chinese, you got to be tenacious. 
A likely factor in Trump's decision to bring Iowa's governor into his administration is Branstad's longtime friendship with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Welcome to Des Moines. The two political leaders have known each other since a sister state exchange brought Xi, then an agricultural official, to Iowa in 1985. Both have reconnected on several occasions, notably in 2012, when the Chinese leader was welcomed to Iowa's capital a year before becoming his country's president. Some say a mutual love of agriculture has helped the pair form a strong bond, and the relationship may ease tensions over Trump's past statements on Chinese currency manipulation, as well as a recent diplomatic mix-up concerning communication with Taiwan considered a rogue province by China. The nation of China is responsible for almost half of America's trade deficit. And that's why we designate them as being a non-market economy. Big thing. They haven't played by the rules. And I know it's time that they're going to start. They're going to start. They've got to. We're all in this thing together, folks. Pending U.S. Senate confirmation, Branstad's move from Des Moines to Beijing may add another footnote to Iowa's history books, as his resignation would allow Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds to become the first female governor of the Hawkeye State. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. According to the National Pipeline Mapping System, there are 2.4 million miles of pipe snaking underneath the United States. 72,000 miles of those pipes are devoted to moving crude oil. Recent attempts to add to the tangle have stirred up controversy. The divisive Keystone XL pipeline was turned back at the door. However, despite overt hostility, the Dakota Access Pipeline was given the green light. The decision was even more polarizing than Keystone, and opposition has, at times, turned violent. This week, the project was stopped in its tracks. John Torpy has the story. Members of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe were dancing this week to chase away the North Dakota winter and to celebrate what they call a victory over an unwanted pipeline. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers halted all construction of the last mile of the Dakota Access Pipeline project, which is proposed to travel 94 feet under a Missouri River reservoir. The pipe will be placed in the proximity of an already existing natural gas line. Dakota Access, the company building the pipeline, says the stoppage will move completion of the project from next January further down the road to April or May of 2017. Energy Transfer Partners, the owners of the pipeline, say the work stoppage has cost more than $450 million, and continued delays will add $83.3 million per month to the construction bill. The pipeline, if completed, will carry oil from North Dakota through South Dakota and across Iowa to a shipping point in Illinois. The route has approval from regulators in all four states. However, the controversy centers on the project crossing just upstream of Standing Rock Sioux Nation. Standing Rock officials say the pipeline threatens their drinking water and will destroy sacred sites. Protesters have been gathering at an encampment near the construction site for months to voice their opposition. Energy Transfer Partners and the Army Corps of Engineers initially agreed the 1,172-mile pipeline was on the safest and most cost-effective path. The initial review took into consideration the number of water crossings, the proximity to homes, and whether the $3.8 billion pipeline crossed wetlands. Company officials have vowed to keep the pipeline on the original route, despite the most recent decision. We're simply an, a, a, a company that builds infrastructure, ha acting lawfully and doing everything we're supposed to do. And we're going to build a safe pipeline and we're going to cross the river at that location. But as far as the route, that, that, that's not going to change. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. As appointments in the new administration continue to be made, one cabinet member's tenure is coming to an end. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack is taking a final run around the track after serving in the nation's highest agricultural office. As the 30th person to hold the post, Vilsack joins an elite club of only four who have held the position for eight or more years. 
Peter Tubbs reports. About 600,000 acres of land. As he completes an eight-year run, Secretary Vilsack promised that the USDA will run through the tape of the current administration's final lap in office. Vilsack discussed a laundry list of past accomplishments at the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation annual meeting, including the growth of ethanol. The recent RFS announcement that uh, gets us to the 15 billion uh, gallon mark, uh, I think it restores uh, the confidence and faith in the RFS. Reducing rural poverty and unemployment, his recent task force on opioid addiction, trade. Farmers understand this, and they understand it because trade impacts their bottom line and improvements in rural clean water. The secretary took the opportunity to build on past clean water programs by announcing the Clean Lakes, Estuaries, and Rivers Initiative, or CLEAR program. And what this program will do is it will provide resources uh, from CRP uh, to assist in the cost of bioreactors and saturated buffers. This will be two additional tools that we will add to the tool chest of CRP. Under this program, uh, we'll provide a 90% cost share. The only qualification is that the land obviously be adjacent to, to water. The incoming Trump administration has pledged to tackle immigration, but Vilsack encouraged comprehensive reform. Everybody knows it's broken. It needs to be fixed. We need to secure the border, but we also have to create some kind of stability in this workforce, particularly in the agricultural space, because 70% of our food is touched at some point in time by an immigrant hand. And a substantial number of those folks came here uh, probably without authority, but need some kind of pathway to legitimacy. Later in the day, Vilsack accepted the Norman Borlaug Medallion at the World Food Prize headquarters in recognition of the work USDA has done in training students for careers in agriculture, especially in developing economies. He encouraged students to improve the world's political stability through food security. And I'm challenging you to think big, to think bold, to think like Norma did. How can I help? How can I be part of the solution? How can I bridge the gap between those who understand agriculture and those who don't? How can I make a safer world through agriculture? How can I feed the hungry? How can I be a great humanitarian? The secretary also reflected on the arc of his career as an elected official. I have been incredibly blessed by the state of Iowa. Uh, there's no reason why a kid from Pennsylvania should have had the opportunities I had, but for the, the generosity and the, the openness and the willingness of people of the state to give me a chance to serve as a mayor, uh, to serve as a state senator, and as a governor. And. Uh, I certainly will always be indebted to President Obama for giving me the chance to serve him and the country uh, in this position. For Mark to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Next, the Market to Market Report. Despite profit taking, good weather, and a bearish stocks report, the commodity markets finished mostly higher. For the week, March wheat rose 12 cents, and the nearby corn contract moved 12 and a quarter cents higher. A 25-cent gain in the soy complex was undone by South American weather and the WASD report revealing higher global stocks. However, the January soybean contract managed to finish a dime higher for the week. January meal stayed with the trend, adding $6.30 per ton. In the softs, March cotton lost 24 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, January Class 3 milk futures fell 23 cents. The livestock sector gained back some of last week's losses as the February cattle contract added $1.66, January feeders put on $1.35, and the February lean hog contract increased 14% over last week, adding $7.52. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index increased 77 basis points. Crude oil fell back after last week's 12% gain, losing 18 cents per barrel. Gold fell for the sixth week, losing $15.90 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained more than five points to finish the week at 391.60. 
Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Tom Fitzenmeyer. Tom, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. We're excited to have you here, but before we get started, you can listen to our market discussion anytime by downloading our market analysis podcast from our website. That's at IPTV.org slash M2M. Let's take a look at this wheat market. Finally, a move to the upside, 12 cents on the week. Is it this cold snap coming in that's really driving this market? I think so. And we didn't exports weren't all that bad this week. I, I think the, the wheat market's probably trying to establish a base here. It's probably going to be a choppy sort of affair. But, uh, but I think over time, we're going to start to see wheat start to kind of work, work up a little bit. I, uh, I think we ended up March wheat around, I don't know, 408, 410, somewhere in that range. I, I, think, I think it's got a shot at mo moving up in that 430, 435 range, maybe even. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't get, let myself be too bearish wheat wheat at these levels, I, I, th I think there's some potential there. Do you think a lot of these uh, winter wheat acres are going to be grazed off rather than harvested for grain? Or if we push into that 430, 440, does that pencil out enough for most guys to run the combines? Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think there's any question that there's been some calves left out on, left out there to, to graze that grand. Now, with the weather turning here, that's probably going to come to a screeching halt here. But uh, yeah, I, I would. And I don't, I'm not super familiar with the economics of pr production of wheat, but I would guess you get up into those high, higher levels, and there'll be people starting to think about it again. I mean, there's been some talk about some of the wheat acres going to beans, at part of a contributor to this big supposed bean increase we're going to have next year. And let's talk about that bean acreage increase from a different point of view, from the point of view of corn. We could see some wheat acres go to beans. We could see some cotton acres go to beans. But the bulk of that four or five million acre increase is probably going to come out of this corn market. Would you say? That's what they say. Okay. Well, where do you stand on that, Tom Fitzmaier? I, I hear that after harvest every year, beans are a little higher than corn. Everybody's all excited. I'm going to plant beans because I'm bro so broke. I don't have any money to plant corn, and and you know, beans are going to be great. And 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 I don't think there's any question that we had great bean yields last year. But I don't also don't think there's any question that most people aren't going to plug those kind of yields into their right into their uh, budgets for next year. So I, I, I don't, I'm sure there's going to be some switching, uh, but I don't know that you know, people like to grow corn. Corn yields have been pretty darn good too. Um, and, and, and I understand that the new crop bean price relative to new crop corn, that, the, that ratio favors beans, but it only favors it if you sell them. If you're just sitting there, well, I'm going to plant beans and hope that that does not going to work out so good for you because you've got to remember we have almost a 500 million carryout of beans. South America, except for a little pocket in Argentina, looks quite good, and, and their production's up 24, 26%, something like that. I mean, it's a, it's a big yeah. jump. And then they're talking about a big jump in acreage here, too. So, you know, if you're going to plant beans and, and it's profitable and it looks great, you better get some of them sold. Get some of the markets. So, well, as long as we're talking beans, we do have a question from uh, one of our Twitter followers. Excuse me, a Facebook follower. And we encourage all of you to send in your questions via Facebook and Twitter. You can find us at Market to Market on uh, both those sites. This question comes from James in Kremlin, Oklahoma. He's asking, with this potential big increase in planted bean acres next year, what is the downside price risk? Let's say weather turns around in South America, Brazil does do their 102, 103 million metric tons. We plant four or five million more bean acres on top of an already large carryout. What's our downside risk in this market? And I understand that China's been a good, big, big buyer of beans, but they're not going to be buying that many beans. We, we got new crop beans as high as 1040, 1043, I think, recent, just in the last few days. Uh, I, I think you could see that and easily an eight in front of that possibly as, as seven. I mean, we're, they're talking about potential for the carry out, getting as high as seven, 800 million under the right circumstances here. So, I mean, uh, and I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but I'm just saying there's huge downside and huge risk. If you're one of these guys that wants to go out and plant beans, uh, great, but you better get them covered somehow. Did the market react to uh, Governor Branstad's appointment uh, to Chinese ambassador on the soybean side, he's got such a rapport with the Chinese leaders. Did that inspire some confidence? I, it did in me. But, okay. But, 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 and, and I kept kind of watching for the market, but I did never got a sense during the week that the market was responding to that. Okay. I, I thought it was a positive because we've had all this hand-wringing over fighting with the Chinese and afraid it's going to hurt our uh, yeah. ag exports and all that. So I, I really kind of thought 
maybe there would be a stronger reaction to it. Uh, I, I just, I, I just, I think it's a good thing, and, and I think he's going to be a good buffer between the two governments. So two leaders. I, yeah. Well, now let's circle back to the corn market. Uh, we had another bump this week, twelve cents to the upside. If I've got old crop corn in the bin. Am I aggressively selling up here at 360, or do I hold on and let this thing keep running? I don't know if you're aggressive, but I guess okay. you'd probably start, and they'd just start feeding some in here. The, the, the problem with the, with the corn market is there's tons of it around, and 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 the, and, and they're going to use that basis just like a, ta a, a wagon, end gate in a wagon. I know nobody uses wagons with end gates anymore. But <laughs> some of us do. Some, yeah, of, some of us old school guys do. Few, those people can understand. <laughs> but every, every time you get up here, they're, they're going to... They're going to close that down a little bit, widen the basis out, and when it goes down, they're going to open up the, t the end gate and try and draw more corn in. So I, I have a sense that a lot of farmers are holding out for a minimum of around 330 on the cash market, sort of central Iowa type markets. And, and I think they'd really be aggressive sellers if they get up to 350. So I think we're kind of, that's part of the reason we're sort of locked in this trading range is that whenever, you know, you get, March corn up in that 360, 365 range, that translates to the sort of the lower range of, of those sales. So, and, and end users understand that too. So their interest tends to fall off when you get up to those levels. And then it, it all gets sort of rekindled down at that 340, 335 range. So and we're just gonna have to grind through. We're, we're stuck, yeah. Looking at the new crop with a transfer of acres into beans, is there opportunity here to uh, to see this new crop corn D17 yeah. pop a little bit? That got to like 388 on Friday. I, I, you know, I can't get it. With that potential sitting here, and I understand the carryout's big, but ethanol demands have been quite good and c could get better. Um, exports have been pretty pretty darn good, uh, and we're in a sort of driver's seat, at least you know, probably through March, for, for, for corn exports. So, um, yeah, I, I guess if, if you got up in that 405, 410 range, uh, I, I would certainly start making new crop sales. Okay figuring that there's a chance under the right circumstances, a weather issue or whatever, that you could maybe even go to 450. But I, okay. I'd sure start at those lower levels. and Get north of four and yeah, Some kind of a scale-up program from there, yeah. Let's talk this livestock market. Live cattle up a buck 66. We, we ran higher, $20 higher. We stepped back. Now are we looking to make another leg higher, or are we just on a step back before we head back to the basement? Well, that's the question. I was, I was looking at my charts before I, I came over to do the show, and that, that cattle market is in a nice little uptrend, uptrending channel here. We went down Friday, sort of checked out that, checked out that support level on, on that up, upward trending line. Uh, if that holds, then I think we're, we're probably okay. If we start breaking through that, and then I, then I think we've got problems. The problem is we still have a fair amount of beef around. We still have, most of the buying's been done for the holidays, so, so that part is gonna kinda go away. Um, but having said that, you're heading into a period where sometimes weather can give you some pretty nice pops in cattle yet too. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm, I'm trying to be cautiously optimistic, uh, but there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot, of, I mean, despite the rally in pork, there's still a yeah. fair amount of that. I'm, I'm a little concerned about this, the, what, this rally in the dollar and the effect that's gonna have. I mean, you can talk about we're mad at China or whatever, but if the, if, the, if the dollar keeps going higher, that's a huge headwind for all of us trying to yeah. export Especially on commodities. the premium products like the meats. Correct. Feeder cattle, uh, just following live cattle higher here as long as corn stays in the range? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I, I mean, uh, th there's, there's guys wanting to walk some corn off the, off the farm by buying cattle. Historically, that doesn't usually work all that great, but I can see why they want to give it a shot. And, and we've had a nice rally in the cattle market that's maybe given them an opportunity to lock that in. So, um, yeah, I, I think that the demand probably for feeders is going to stay strong st simply because of that. Okay. Now, you alluded to it. We were talking about the live cattle markets. Lean hogs, Tom Fitzenmeyer, $7 plus to the upside this past week. What happened? Yeah, totally caught everybody off guard. Well, well, we've got lighter numbers. Weights have come down a little bit. We had a, really, a pretty darn good export number. We've got excellent packer, packer demand for, for these hogs. And yeah, you, you, you've had a big bump, jump up. Now, you know, the USDA's prediction for hog prices is really 
quite a bit lower than where we're at today. So I, I, it seems to me if you get these June hogs up in that 76 to 77 plus area, you need to be looking at making some sales if you've got, uh, if you've got market risk on any of the hogs you're producing. Looking at, I know this was a concern earlier in the year, uh, slaughter capacity, you know, hanging space for these animals. Last week, if, if I remember correctly, we had the largest hog slaughter in history, and this week we put another $7 on the market. Does that tell you that maybe we, we don't need to be as concerned about capacity? Well, probably. I, it, it doesn't really matter because we've got a lot of capacity coming at us next fall. And, and so that's going to change the dynamics of all that, too. And, 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 and that's going to be really interesting to see how, how much those plants are willing to compete with one another and, and possibly pay up for, for hog prices. So that, that's something coming on next fall that I, I think is going to be pretty interesting. But you're, you made the point earlier, it's those summer months where we're not going to have that capacity online. Right. And what was your target, 77? 77 on the June, June and July hogs. I, I think anything north of that, and you, you gotta look at it pretty, pretty hard. All right. One of the stories that's been ongoing here, well, particularly since the election, has been the drop in gold prices. Uh, we've got the Federal Reserve Board meeting this next week. Do you think they're gonna raise interest rates? Absolutely. So is gold gonna to continue to slide? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, what, what, why would you buy it? Why, 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 what would be the reason to own gold right now? I, I, I can think of none. And, and interest rates I, I are, are gonna work higher, probably gonna have another rate next summer, I would, okay. I would guess. So uh, you, you've got to, I mean, that's, that's going to impact land values, too. You've got rising interest rates, lower, lower um, income Right, potential. commodity prices, so that, I higher mean, rates. That's, that's going to be a headwind for land values, too, it's a I think. Pinch. Well, Tom Fitzmaier, thanks so much for taking the time to join us this okay. week. Thanks, Mike. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but Tom and I will keep the market conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, available on our website. While you're there, check out this week's M2M podcast, as Peter Tubbs tells us about why young veterinarians are working in remote, underserved regions of the country. And then join us again next week for our feature story to see how it all plays out. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.